Thank you very much for joining this presentation. My name is Marke van Blitteswijk. I'm an assistant professor of neuroscience at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. Today I will talk to you about how targeted long read sequencing methods can be used to assess an expanded repeat in a gene called C9R72. By the end of this presentation, you should be familiar with methods that can be used to size and detect c 9 72 repeat expansions. Moreover, you should understand that targeted long read sequencing can accurately measure the length of the expansion as well as the presence of interruptions. A repeat expansion in c 9 72 is associated with two fatal neurodegenerative diseases, namely FTD, frontotemporal dementia, and ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. FTD is the second most common cause of dementia in individuals below 65 years of age. It affects neurons in the frontal and temporal cortex, causing changes in behavior, personality, and language impairment. Patients often die within 7 to 11 years after the onset of symptoms. ALS is the most common form of motor neuron disease. It results in degeneration of upper and lower motor neurons in the brain and spinal cord. This results in progressive muscle weakness and spasticity, affecting the arms, leg and trunk, but also muscles involved in speech, swallowing and breathing. Consequently, patients with ALS often die within three to seven years after the onset of symptoms due to respiratory failure. There is considerable clinical, genetic, and pathological overlap between FTD and ALS. And today, I will focus on the genetic overlap. In 2011, two papers were published in Neuron. One study led by Dr. Rosa Rademakers and another study led by Dr. Brian Trainer. Both these studies reported c 9 72 repeat expansions. And it turns out that they are actually the most common genetic cause of both FTD and ALS. This major discovery was made roughly a decade ago. Regardless, many questions remain unanswered. We do know, however, that there is a lot of variability. Variability in the age at onset, survival after onset, disease symptoms, even within families. Some individuals may develop FTD, other individuals, ALS, or a combination of both diseases. The repeat itself contains six nucleotides, four Gs and two Cs. It's a hexanucleotide repeat. And in the general population, people often carry maybe two repeats, five repeats, eight repeats, a little bit more. That's all within the normal range. Patients with FTD or ALS, however, can harbor hundreds to thousands of repeats, and this has major consequences. It, for instance, reduces the expression levels of c 9 or 72 It also results in the formation of RNA foci that contain flawed RNAs, trapping RNA binding proteins, and resulting in hampering, well, basically hampering the function of these proteins. We can also see dipeptide repeat proteins. And this is really interesting because you think about it, this expansion is located in a non-coding area. It should not be translated into a protein, but it is. And that's due to a process called repeat associated non-ATG translation. And the two most abundant dipeptide repeat proteins are poly GA and poly GP. And today I will cover two topics the length of the c 9 of 72 expansion and the presence of interruptions. But before we discuss that, I think it's important to know more about detection methods for this c 9 of 72 repeat expansion. So in my lab, we generally use a two-step protocol. We start with a fluorescent PCR, a fragment length analysis that allows you to determine the length of the wild type allele. If you see two peaks, then you know that this individual is heterozygous and has basically two wild type alleles, maybe two repeats on one allele and five repeats on another allele. When you see a single peak, it's more challenging to interpret the results because there could be multiple explanations. It's possible that this person carries two repeats on one allele and two repeats on the other allele. But it's also possible that this person carries two repeats on one allele and a very long expansion on the other allele, making it impossible to detect it using a fluorescent PCR. Thus, the next step is a repeat-primed PCR. 
a reaction with three primers, two primers on both sides of the repeat and a primer that targets the repeat itself. If the expansion is present, then you see this characteristic stutter pattern as shown here on this slide. Without this expansion, no such pattern is observed. And this is really a diagnostic test. But if you want to be 100% sure that the expansion is present or absent, you should do a sudden blot, the gold standard. On this slide on the right, you can see an example of a sudden blot. The expansion is the top band and the wild type allele, the bottom band. And in this case, we're displaying three individuals, three unique individuals and two regions for each individual, the frontal cortex and the cerebellum. And as you may see, there is a significant difference in the repeat length. The repeat length is significantly higher in the frontal cortex than in the cerebellum. Furthermore, there is variability within each region. You can see that there is a smear. It's not one nice, concise band. There is variability. So it's important to realize that there is variability across tissues as well as within tissues. Now, I would also like to stress that a sunburn blot is actually very challenging and time consuming. It takes roughly a week to do one sunburn blot. Now, consequently, people have been considering using other methods. And I'm showing a couple of examples here on this slide. In 2017, a paper was published where they developed a new tool called Expansion Hunter that allows the detection of repeat expansions, including a C9 MOF72 repeat expansion in PCR-free, short read, whole genome sequencing data. They examined more than 3,000 ALS patients and detecting the expansion in roughly 200. And all their patients they detected were correctly identified. So that was very reassuring. At the same time, because they were using short read sequencing data, it is very difficult to reconstruct the expansion itself. So you could consider using other methods. And two examples of moon read sequencing techniques are shown here on the right and in the bottom. A paper published in 2018 and another paper published in 2019. And one of these studies, the first study, was led by my colleague, Dr. Ebert. And they used uh, various technologies at uh, different platforms, Oxford Nanopore Technologies, ONT, and PecBio, Pacific Biosciences. And they also used various strategies, a whole genome sequencing strategy, as well as a targeted strategy using CRISPR-based methods um, to really focus on the area of interest. And these studies were proof of concept studies, but the findings were very promising. And therefore, we decided to look at a larger number of individuals. And we used one specific technique, no M sequencing developed by PecBio. For this study, we investigated 28 well-characterized C9 of 72 expansion carriers, and their characteristics are shown in the table on the left. As you can see, 50% female, an age at onset around 63 years, and we obtained a lot of detailed information. Information about the expression levels of C9 of 72, about the methylation levels of the C9 of 72 promoter, about the levels of dipeptide repeat proteins, RNA foci, and the repeat length based on southern blood estimates. We extracted high molecular weight genomic DNA from the cerebellum using the recovery kit from Agilent. And up to 10 microgram of DNA was used for each sample on one smart cell on the SQL2 platform. And we used, as I mentioned, the CRISPR-Cas9 based method to excise the area of interest. We also used a one hour extension, four hour immobilization, and a 30 hour movie time. And here you can see an overview of our bioinformatic approach. You can see that we used PecBio's pipeline with modifications for long repeats. And I don't know how familiar you are with circular consensus sequencing reads, CCS reads, Basically, our idea is that you sequence the same piece over and over again. And because you do that, you increase the accuracy of your reads. And we said, well, basically, we need two things. We need to look at the length of the repeat expansion, but we also want to look at the presence of interruptions. And therefore, we used two different strategies. A standard strategy where we said, okay, we want to keep 
all the reads with at least one full pass spanning the entire expansion and an accuracy of 80% or more. And on top of that, we want to do a more stringent analysis, high quality reads with at least seven passes and an accuracy of 99% or more. We then aligned the reads to the human reference genome, HD38, and we used the clustering method to distinguish the wild type allele from the expanded allele. And of course, we made sure that we included the flanking regions because we really wanted to focus on those reads that spanned the entire expansion. And here you can see an example of one individual. And for this individual, more than 250 CCS reads were obtained. And as you can see, there is a nice peak that refers to the C9 or 72 locus. So we have in on target reads as expected. We've also visualized it in IGV, as you can see on this slide, with forward reads, reverse reads, and then an insertion shown in purple. And the number of nucleotides is specified in white. I know that it's difficult to see, but what's more important is that this figure also specifies the region. And it's the region we're interested in. It's indeed the C9 of 72 gene and the inter the the insertion, the C9 of 72 expansion itself, is indeed present in either the first intron or the promoter region as where it should be, basically. Then we looked at the distribution of the reads, and we were able to obtain more than 3,500 CCS reads in total, all individuals combined, including more than our well, almost 2,700 reads for the wild type allele and more than 800 for the expanded allele. And subsequently, we said, okay, let's look at the length. Let's look at the length of the wild type allele. And it varied between two reads, uh, two repeats and 11 repeats. And that's correct because we were able to compare it to the results of our fluorescent PCR. We then looked at the expansion and the expansion size varied from roughly 3 KB to more than 20 KB. And basically 500 repeats up to 3,500 repeats. A histogram is shown on the left. And in this histogram, you can see the frequency and you can see the number of repeats. And the dash line indicates the median of the samples we investigated. And the median was 1,261 repeats, so almost 8 KB. You can see on this slide that there was a lot of variability between the individuals we investigated. Every single individual is displayed, individual 1 to 28. And then we've specified the number of reads for each given individual in each bar. And as you can see, it varies from two reads to almost 100 reads. In the next few slides, I will provide a potential explanation about this um, that may explain this potential variability between these samples. Okay, so on this slide, you can see some extreme cases. We looked at our sudden blot results and we selected an individual with a relatively small expansion and an individual with a relatively long expansion in the cerebellum. And then we looked at our no end sequencing results. And as you can see, the individual with a small expansion is shown in light blue and the individual with a long expansion in dark blue. And clearly we're able to pick up this important difference. So that's very reassuring. We then visualized it in a correlation plot, as shown on this slide, where we've included the number of repeats based on no M sequencing, as well as the number of repeats based on southern blotting. Every single individual is represented by a dot, and the linear regression line is included as well. And as you can see, there is a positive correlation. When the southern blot estimates increase, the no M sequencing estimates increase as well. And you may notice the different colors that we're using. Red, orange, and yellow indicate a relatively high number of reads. And what's interesting is that people with a relatively high number of reads are all located in the bottom left corner, suggesting that people with a smaller expansion actually have a higher number of reads. And that is confirmed here in this plot, a box plot, where the median is specified with a dark a horizontal line and the box blends the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile and we split everyone. We split everyone based on the median. So in light blue you can see people with a relatively small expansion, the bottom 50 percent, and in dark blue people with a relatively long expansion, the top 50 percent. And clearly the people with a relatively small expansion appear to have the highest number of reads. We also noticed something else. When we compare the actual length between 
southern blotting and no hand sequencing, there was a significant difference. And you can see on this slide that there was much more variability based on southern blotting than on no end sequencing. And the estimates also appear to be lower using no end sequencing. So, yes, there is a significant association between no end sequencing and southern blotting, but no end sequencing has a tendency to underestimate the size. We then wondered, okay, now we've basically validated this method, um, but is it relevant? Does it matter what the expansion size in the cerebellum is? And you can see here that, yes, it does matter. And um, this is a survival curve, a Captain Meyer curve. And I should stress that, as you know, the survival differs depending on whether you're looking at patients with FTD or patients with ALS. So we've adjusted for the disease subgroup in our model. And on this slide, individuals with relatively small expansion, the bottom 50, are shown in light blue. And again, people with relatively long expansions, dark blue, the top 50%. And there is a significant difference. The survival is 4.9 years for people with a small expansion and 1.8 years for people with a long expansion. And that indicates that it might be beneficial to have a small expansion. We also spotted something else, which is specified here. We looked at the number of repeats and one specific transcript, the relative expression levels of intranorm B containing transcripts. And I don't know how familiar you are with these transcripts for C9 or 72, but there are basically three well-known transcripts, variant one, variant two, and variant three. But it's also important to look at intron containing transcripts. And that's what we're doing here. We're looking at intron 1B, which is located after the expansion downstream. And it's basically a surrogate marker for transcripts that contain the expansion. And on this slide, I'm showing that as the number of repeats decreases, the expression levels of these expansion containing transcripts go up. And that does make sense, because it suggests that if you have a small expansion, it might be easier to transcribe it, resulting in higher levels of transcripts that contain the expansion. We then looked at the dipeptide repeat protein levels. And here, again, we're displaying two correlation plots with the number of repeats, and in this case, the burden of dipeptide repeat proteins, specifically PolyGP and PolyGA. And a similar inverse correlation is seen. As the number of repeats decreases, the burden of dipeptide repeat proteins goes up. And this does make sense as well, because I just told you that if you have a smaller expansion, it's easier to transcribe it. They have higher levels of expansion-containing transcripts. And these expansion-containing transcripts serve as templates for repeat-associated non-ATG translation, REN translation, therefore causing higher levels of dipeptide repeat proteins as well. So the next topic I would like to cover today are interruptions. And interruptions are known to act as disease modifiers in other repeat expansion disorders. But we know very little about the purity of the C9 or 72 repeat expansion. So to this end, we restricted our analysis to high quality reads with at least seven passes and an accuracy of 99% or more. We had 2,500 high quality CCS reads in total all samples combined, including more than 2,300 for the wild hyperdeal and more than 200 for the expansion. And as you know, we're looking at a C9 or 72 expansion with four Gs and two Cs. So if it's relatively pure, you expect to see a very high GC content. And that's exactly what we saw. In this plot, every single individual is displayed and the bar represents the percentage GC. And as you can see, it's roughly 100% for every single individual. So the GC content is very high. A's and T's are only occasionally encountered. We then looked at the expansion itself. And you can see that here, the GGGG CC repeat. And again, every single individual is included, individual 1 to 28. But this time, the bar represents the percentage GGGG CC. And it's not 100%. It's not. But it's pretty close. It's actually 96%. So that seems to indicate that the expansion is relatively pure and that interruptions, at least in the cerebellum of these individuals, account for less than 
5 or 4% of the expansion. You can also visualize it using a waterfall plot. And this is a waterfall plot for one particular individual with more than 20 CCS reads, which are shown on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you can see the position of the nucleotides. If the GTTGCC repeat is present, the hexanucleotide repeat we're interested in, it's blue. If another sequence is present, another motif, it's displayed in gray. Now, you do see some green lines, but not that many, and they appear to occur at random positions. There is no clear pattern. And you can see a similar phenomenon here, a similar pattern for another individual. So this is an individual with 12 high-quality CCS reads, and the position of the nucleotides is specified. And again, a lot of blue, and you do see a couple of other colors. In this case, we specified other motives using different colors. The most common alternative motive is a motive with three Gs and two Cs. Now, based on the plots I've showed you and the bar graphs, we said, okay, well, every once in a while we see interruptions, not very often, but they are completely random. So maybe they're not real. Maybe they actually represent rare sequencing errors. And that's not surprising given the GC content, the length of the expansion, um, its repetitiveness. So we think it's actually quite likely that they represent rare sequencing errors. So what have I shared with you today? Well, hopefully I've convinced you that no MC9 or 72 sequencing can spend the entire repeat expansion. That repeat lengths based on no M sequencing correlate with those obtained using southern blotting, but that there appears to be a bias towards smaller expansions and that the sizes might be underestimated. I've also demonstrated that smaller expansions are associated with prolonged survival, with higher levels of expansion containing transcripts, and with higher levels of dipeptide repeat proteins. Moreover, the expansion has a high GC content and appears to be relatively pure. Thus, NOAM sequencing is a powerful tool and it has the ability to review relevant clinical pathological associations for c 9 orf 72 related disorders. It actually stresses the important role of the cerebellar expansion size in these fatal neurodegenerative diseases. I'd like to thank all my lab members, particularly Maria de Jesus Hernandez, as well as my colleagues at Mayo Clinic, Florida, Minnesota, Arizona, um, my colleague, Mark Ebert, um, who spearheaded this research, our clinicians who have collected all these precious samples, our genome analysis core led by Dr. Wieben, Ross for generating all this no M sequencing data, PecBio for their advice and guidance, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, MDA, for funding this specific project, LabRoot for hosting this webinar, and of course I would like to thank you for watching this video. Hopefully you've enjoyed watching it. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, very well done. Awesome job. Um, well, pretty much from here, we'll just do some quick editing on the front and back end since there was no interruptions during your presentation. And then we'll have it ready for the event in just a few weeks. That's good. A few weeks. They said, I thought it was like um, September 30th, right? I think that's the actual event. <laughs> yes, yes, the 30th. So I guess about a week and a half or so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you were saying a few weeks, I think like, oh, then yeah. we get <laughs> um, But was everything clear and easy to understand? A few yeah, I thought that, <laughs> yeah, I thought you did a good job at uh, clearly communicating and it went very smoothly. And again, I'll send you the preview link so you can let me know your thoughts. Um, if you feel that it's necessary to do any kind of re-recording, that's definitely an option. So we can do that if uh, you think that that needs to be re oh. I, I think it's fine. I, I don't really, it, it's always hard to predict, right? But because I haven't listened to my own presentation right. yet, but I, there were a few instances where I stumbled a little bit. I was like, oh, 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 and I changed it a little bit, but I think I corrected everything. Um, mm -hmm. It should be fine, probably. And I don't know about other people. As I said, I haven't really done this before, uh, any yeah. recording something. Um, so I don't know if, yeah how this compares to what other people do that's hard for me to guess <laughs> i don't know yeah. 
No, and I know it's definitely different uh, presenting to a webcam versus an audience that you can't read. So um, it definitely has its own challenges, but I thought you did a great job with, uh, with doing so. Great, okay. Is there awesome. anything else I need to know or need to do? Um, I'm just gonna check in and make sure that we have um, all of the info that we need from you. And it looks like we do have all of your abstract and learning objectives, so we're all set there. If anything comes up, I will let you know. If not, I'll send that link over to you when it's ready. And if mm -hmm. you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to me. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for your help today. Thank you. <laughs> have a good rest of your, your day. And how do I close this? Do I need to do something specific or can I just close the wing? No. Um, you can close it. I'm also going to end the uh, recording now and it will automatically close your window out. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.